Welcome to CBH. Today we're talking about interesting pulp magazine precursors to modern comic books. The important thing about understanding the pulp history of comic books is to better understand the creators of the original golden age of comics, as well as what plot or storylines were on the pulse of the readers back then. And some of these amazing people are Jerry Siegel, Joe Schuster, John Broom, Gil Kane, Gardner Fox, Joe Simon, Jack Kirby, Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Mort Weisinger, Jerry Robinson, Wally Wood, Robert Kaniger, Joe Kubert, Carmine Infantino, and Stan Lee. As incredible as these people were, they read their own entertainment when they were younger. And a lot of that was found in early pulp magazines and newspaper comic strips. Literary ancestors or antecedents can go back thousands of years. But for the sake of this video, we're going to start at 1886 and then domino our way forward through different pulp characters until we reach our final superheroes. In 1886, we have two works that were created. The first one is a dime novel named Nicholas Carter, who is a super detective. And the second one is a penny dreadful of an older British boogeyman legend called spring Heel Jack. Now these two characters would, through literary ancestry, be linked into Superman and Batman. In 1886, Nick Carter, Master Detective, was a dime novel published by Ormond Smith and John Russell Coriel that premiered a private detective who had super strength, super knowledge, excellent at every hobby. He was described as having bronze skin and he was a little giant at 5'4". Now most of these qualities would then be carried over into later pulps which would then be used in our Superman that we know today. In 1912, we have John Carter of Mars, who premiered in a pulp magazine serial by Edgar Rice Burroughs. In this story, gravity was less on Mars, which allowed John Carter, who was a human from Earth, to jump great leaps in these old stories. In Action Comics 1, 1938, Superman had the physique of an alien from his home planet who could jump one-eighth of a mile with the lighter Earth gravity, hence he could, quote-unquote, leap tall buildings in a single bound. One 1930 science fiction novel that deserves mention in the lineage of Superman is Philip Wiley's Gladiator about a scientist that injects his pregnant wife with an ant formula that gives their soon-to-be-born son the proportional strength and resilience of an ant. Not only would the later Ant-Man and Spider-Man gain insect strength in the 1960s, but this superhuman baby would be raised by supremely humble parents in the Midwest and would even lift a car as shown on the cover of Action Comics 1. Now many of the traits we've talked about would then be carried over into the next character who was in 1933, Doc Savage. Now his name was actually Clark Savage Jr., just like Clark Kent, and he premiered in quote unquote The Man of Bronze in 1933. So as Nicholas Carter had bronze skin, Doc Savage was the Man of Bronze, just as Superman was the Man of Steel. Doc Savage was called a Superman in a 1934 pulp magazine ad. He could sidestep bullets and lived in his fortress of solitude in the Arctic, just like Superman would later do. Many of these traits would go on to be implemented into Superman the Man of Steel, either as a instant conception of the character or later developed. Now does this mean that Siegel and Schuster read Nick Carter or any of those other stories? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But it does show that one story inspires another and suddenly you have themes all over pop culture of the time and they synthesize into the Superman comics. Or they just read those directly and utilize some of those character traits. Now here's another really interesting linkage between Doc Savage and the Golden Age of Comics. Lester Dent wrote most of the Doc Savage pulp stories, notably The Red Skull, which was an early story in 1933. Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, notorious pulp magazine fans, depicted a villain called the Red Skull in three appearances in 1941. The character creation was credited to their friend Ed Heron, so maybe Ed Heron read the Doc Savage pulp. Now Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster also mentioned in an interview that they watched Douglas Fairbanks in the movie The Black Pirate to get the heroic facial body expressions for Superman. Now that movie came out around the same time as a lot of these pulps, so I included that in this presentation. So now let's talk about the different pulp precursors to Batman. In 1886, we have a penny dreadful of Spring-Heeled Jack, 
which was put together and summarized all the rumors of this British legend into an entertaining story of a rich young man whose parents were killed. He then stalks the streets to use trickery as a vigilante against criminals and engage in a wee bit of mischief. Yes, these traits do sound like that man. In 1905, there is another British story called The Scarlet Pimpernel by Emma Orksey about an Englishman who used disguise and a red flower as a symbol to save aristocrats from violent French revolutionaries. Yes, the red flower symbol is something Zorro would also do similarly, as well as a couple of characters we'll get to. Now in 1914, Jimmy Dale, The Grey Seal by Frank L. Packard about a wealthy playboy who puts on a costume sneaks on rooftops, leaves a gray paper seal behind to mark his conquest, and eventually wages war on criminal organizations. And yes, I know, this is sounding again a lot like Batman. Now the gray seal has an interesting intersection with the Phantom newspaper strip, as well as the Douglas Fairbanks film, The Black Pirate, and additionally, the later Batman. Now the Phantom newspaper strip was originally created in 1936, by Lee Falk, which was originally to be named the Grey Ghost. The name Phantom was used in pulps as far back as 1914 in the Grey Seal who fought a villain Phantom. In a homage to both the Phantom as well as the Grey Seal, the Grey Ghost was Batman's child hero in the 1990s animated series. Now a small tangent on the Phantom, Lee Falk has mentioned that his 1936 Phantom had some of his origin inspired by the 1926 Douglas Fairbanks film, The Black Pirate, where his son's father is killed before his eyes by pirates and the young nobleman survives and swears an oath of vengeance on them. And yes, I know, that also sounds like Batman. So now we have a lineage of characters that start off at spring Hill Jack, then the Scarlet Pimpernel, the Grey Seal, then into the Phantom, using ideas from the Douglas Fairbanks film The Black Pirate, and now we're at 1930 with a character called The Shadow, which was created by Walter B. Gibson for Street and Smith, a man who uses trickery to give a sense of mysticism to criminals. He uses disguises to infiltrate criminal organizations and disguises himself as a wealthy billionaire playboy named Lamont Cranston. Interestingly enough, the first Batman comic written by Bob Kane with Bill Finger was a rewrite from the 1936 pulp shadow story called Partners in Peril. Now, even more so along the pulp theme, the 1938 The Shadow in the Face of Doom appears to be a direct inspiration to the appearance of Two-Face in Detective Comics 66, 1942. Now, in 1939, we have a character, the Black Bat, who is a pulp character that uses guns, much like the Golden Age Batman, and originated in a detective magazine. This character came out around the same time as Batman and is thought to be an example of parallel thinking. So editor Whitney Ellsworth brokered a deal where both companies continued to use their characters. He really is a wholly separate character, however, because he is a district attorney lawyer who was blinded by a criminal throwing acid in his face, scarring it, and this origin was used for Two-Face in 1942. Now despondent, the Black Bat went to many doctors, eventually finding one who would graft pieces of a cadaver eye. The Black Bat then developed superhuman sight from this incident and still pretended to be blind. This power set was then used for the origin for Daredevil when he was created in 1964. So although there are some superficial similarities to Batman, the Black Bat appears to be more of a creative pulp ancestor to Two-Face and Daredevil. So does this mean that Bob Kane with Bill Finger read spring Heel Jack or those other stories? Well, they certainly read The Shadow Partners in Peril, but other than that, maybe they did and maybe they didn't. But it does mean that likely one story inspires others and suddenly you have a lot of pulps repeating the same themes and many of these themes were likely read here or there by one or both of these guys and used on Batman. This among many examples shows that many of the early comic books, especially detective comics, were in many ways cartoonized pulp stories. So now that we have pulp roots to Superman and Batman done, let's examine pulp roots to other genre characters of comic books. Now Edgar Rice Burroughs published Tarzan in 1912 about an orphan white boy raised by apes in the African jungle. Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote The Land That Time Forgot in 1918. Volcanic activity preserved the dinosaurs in an island off of the coast of Antarctica. In 1936, 
the company later known as Marvel Comics would produce Kazar in his very own pulp magazine based partially on those Tarzan stories. Now this same company would then make their very own Golden Age Kazar comic in 1939 in Marvel Comics 1. Now this was set in Africa, not in the later more famous Savage Land. Now more than 20 years later, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee would revamp Kazar into a new Silver Age version and then combine him with the Antarctic Savage Land concept from the Edgar Rice Burroughs novels in Uncanny X-Men 10 1965 and this was actually titled The World That Time Forgot which is very similar to Edgar Rice Burroughs book The Land That Time Forgot. So what Jack and Stan did was essentially get the concept of Kazar, revamp him for the Silver Age and put even more Edgar Rice Burroughs themes into it and now we have Silver Age or more modern Khazar Savage Land Adventure. So now let's talk about science fiction roots in pulp magazines. In 1927, we have Buck Rogers, who premiered as Anthony Rogers, in a pulp magazine, and he had a flying jetpack. I've always enjoyed the hero who can use ingenuity, engineering, and jetpacks to fly. A fantastic metaphor for self-discipline, bravery, and luck with a modern-day Icarus having to stay careful not to fly too close to the ground or the sun. Now, Buck Rogers' newspaper strip was in 1929. This newspaper strip went beyond jetpacks and talked about a lot of science fiction themes that went and echoed on into other strips and other comic books, and we'll talk about that in episode four. But for here, we're gonna stick to jetpacks. There was later a King of the Rocket Men film in 1949, and then a mystery in Space 90 in 1964 with Adam Strange. Then there was the Rocketeer from Rocketeer Adventure magazine in 1988, and all of these characters were using jetpacks. What's amazing about this is that one pulp magazine in 1927 could then create domino characters throughout pop culture. In 1931, we have a character called Nighthawk, an English pulp about a wealthy man named Thurston Kyle who fought crime in the mechanized wingsuit. He was referred to as the Winged Avenger in 1932, and he is most possibly the first flying armor suited superhero. Now this type of winged hero would be used again with Red Raven in 1940, a new Nighthawk in Marvel who premiered in 1969 and his name was Kyle Richmond, then Falcon, who debuted in 1969, but wouldn't get mechanized wings until 1974. But it's also a weird coincidence that both Nighthawks from 1931 and 1969 both had the name Kyle. Now in 1933, we have G8 and his battle aces in a World War I era pulp series by ex-flying military man Robert Hogan. He injected much of his own experiences into this pulp magazine series, which would later inspire many wartime flying comics. One of the most memorable runs was Joe Kubert and Robert Kaniger's Enemy Ace, created in 1964. Enemy Ace is one of DC's Silver Age great runs with amazing stories and art, but when read with G8 in mind, its similarly set stories in World War I take on a whole different life. Now in 1934, the Lensman Pulp series by Edward Smith, PhD, took science fiction to a whole other level. This was about a galactic patrol with each member worthy of a lens attached to their hand, capable of transmitting energy and translating interstellar languages. Their mission was to defend civilization. Sounds like the Green Lantern Corps, which was originally mentioned in Showcase 22 1959 by John Broom and Gil Kane. Now in 1936, we have The Suicide Squad, a pulp series written by Emil Tepperman of an FBI task force that combats domestic threats to the USA. In 1959, there was a new Suicide Squad, which were four non-powered adventurers who went up against powered beings. Then in 1987, we have the modern Suicide Squad, which was a covert group of prisoners on forced missions against world threats. This is another episode of CBH. The important thing about understanding the pulp history of comic books is to better understand the creators of the original Golden Age of Comics, as well as what plot or storylines were on the pulse of the readers back then. The notion that one story likely inspires others and suddenly you have a whole lot of pulps repeating the same themes with many of these themes likely being read by a comic creator here and there and then used to create our favorite characters is an important one. That is the key concept to understand. Cheers.